This is the 22nd in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we want to think about how many times a map hits a given point. We want to count that number, and then we want to watch how that number changes as we deform the map. Suppose we have a map, a smooth map, phi takes p to q manifolds, and uh, to keep things simple, let's suppose they have the same dimension. So we're hoping to count numbers of points that are struck by a given by the map, the number of times uh, that a, a point is struck. So uh, what we'll do first of all is to say this, uh, we'll, we'll assume that they're oriented manifolds just to make it again a bit easier. Both P and Q are oriented manifolds. In other words, we have charts chosen on them. Um, so the transition maps are orientation preserving maps. They're maps with positive determinant of the, of the derivative. Then um, uh, the sign of phi at some point in P is 1 if phi um, is orientation preserving is orientation preserving diffeomorphism near P naught minus 1 if phi is an orientation reversing diffeomorphism near p naught and zero otherwise when it, it's not a, a local diffeomorphism near p naught if we take a point um, take a point q naught in um, in q um, so we take point q naught in q and suppose that if uh, if the number of points uh, points in p such that uh, phi of p is q naught is finite if that happens um, and then um, if if that happens then um, we'll say that uh, the 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 degree of uh, at q naught of phi is defined to be the sum uh, for p and p with phi of p equal to q naught the sum over all those points of the sign at p of phi. Now, um, a map uh, phi takes p to q is said to be proper if um, phi inverse of any compact set is compact. Uh, in general, that's obviously not typically the case. For example, constant maps on, on, on a non-compact p would not be proper maps. But it's not so unusual if P and Q have the same dimension. We sort of expect we have a curve P to curve Q. We map P to Q by this sort of shadow map here. You can see there might be some, some critical points. But typically, most points will have only finitely many pre-images. Maybe one here, three here, one here. Um, so it's... Uh, uh, and, and this is also proper uh, because if you take some compact region here, you'll have some sort of compact image up to upstairs. So um, if we have a, a regular map, um, if we take a, a regular point, um, or sorry, a regular value, uh, Q naught of a proper uh, map, proper smooth map, phi takes P to Q, um, uh, and uh, with a dimension as as always dimension p is going to be dimension q, then um, what we know is that um, each point then is a regular point, each point mapping to q is, is a regular point, so p, v of p equals q naught uh, implies because it's a regular value that, that p is a regular point, and so um, since so phi must have, uh, phi prime of p must be onto, but these are equal dimension. So if you have a if you have a linear transformation of equal dimensional vector spaces, so phi prime of p takes t p p to t q on q is a linear map of vector spaces. They're equal dimensional, and it's surjective. That means it's a linear isomorphism. But if it's a linear isomorphism, then the inverse function theorem just is that phi of p is a diffeomorphism near p. And therefore, it must have a well-defined degree at that point. Degree at p phi, sorry, sine, must have a well-defined sine, sine p phi 
is plus or minus 1. Um, but also, um, the, um, the, point, the, the idea being that if you have this diffeomorphism, so you have some uh, q-naught, um, then the, uh, each point in P that maps to q-naught, so maybe there's many of them, maybe there's a P2, P1, P0, all mapping to the same point q, um, if these points map to q, um, then um, by the um, by the fact that this is a there's a diffeomorphism nearby, you get an open set around that point, an open set around that point, an open set around that point, um, in which the map is a diffeomorphism. Um, so, uh, so that gets us started at thinking about how, how what this map looks like, but there's a bit more to it. Um, there are only finitely many of these p's, p naught, p one, p two, and so on, because uh, the preimage of the point will have to be um, will have to be compact. So, um, so we'll say that, we'll see that then, phi inverse of set of q naught uh, has to be compact. But uh, every point in it has to be isolated. We said a picture like this, where it's a local diffeomorphism um, to some somewhere around this p naught somewhere around this q naught and even each pi to some q naught so this is to be a compact set with every uh, point in that compact set uh, being uh, surrounded by an open set containing no other point of that same compact set so that so they're discrete um, so it's a discrete compact set um, but it's also compact, and so it's finite. So they have finitely many points mapping to a given q naught at a regular, at a regular value, right? So q naught is over here is regular value. So what we find is that, in other words, that um, if you take a regular value at q naught, and then the points in P that map, let's write it as P q naught, um, is defined to be the set of P and P such that phi of P is Q naught, the pre-image of Q naught is, is uh, finite. Okay, so, um, so again, a covering map is one for which every point of Q lies in an evenly covered open set. So a picture in the, lo the local picture, locally in Q, little open sets of Q, uh, each one is the image of an open set in P, which is disjoint union of open sets, each on each of which it's a diffeomorphism. Okay, so then we have the obvious um, result that um, if we look at, um, if we take, say, uh, this, again, we take some phi, takes P to Q, um, it's a proper uh, smooth map, and we assume that dimension of P is the dimension of Q, um, and uh, then, uh, and, and these I should say could be um, uh, perhaps with corners, I have so far not stressed that, but uh, perhaps the, these are manifolds with corners, it doesn't really make any difference for us. Then. Um, uh, the argument goes through exactly the same. If we let Q regular be the set of Q and Q such that uh, Q is a regular point, regular value, so the regular values, then and we let P regular contain P be, uh, P regular is defined to be uh, the set of regular points. Um, then, of course, phi takes P regular to Q regular. And um, and we simply get, which is possibly empty, right? These could be empty as far as we know. Um, but uh, we get, uh, but if it's a proper map, they shouldn't be. And then um, what we get is simply that um, that uh, phi, the restrict to these guys, is a covering map. Uh, and and the the reason is 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 what we've what we've just described that um, that we know that uh, near near the regular points. Uh, in the Q, well, we got exactly that stack disk picture. Um, we had near regular point in Q, we had somehow that 
the, you know, the pre-image of that guy because it's a bunch of open sets on which it was a diffeomorphism. Because it's regular, it's locally by the implicit function theorem diffeomorphism, and we can make the, the set smaller and smaller to make it be uh, just a stack of disks. And in fact, of course, it's, it, there's only finally many of these disks in this sort of picture because uh, we said that we had this compactness argument to show that it's actually uh, near over a regular value. It's actually got only finally many points. So, so this this is sort of useful in in that we can get some idea of what some maps might actually look like. Um, suppose, for example, that we have some phi takes p to q proper map of uh, dim equal dimensional manifolds. Suppose equal dimensional manifolds, and suppose that this dimension is greater than or equal to two, um, and suppose that q is connected. Um, and then suppose that phi has only uh, only a um, uh, discrete set of critical points. Um, so that that would mean um, that uh, we then have um, a picture where somehow. There might be some critical points, but away from the critical points, everything looks like a nice covering map um, going down, as we've drawn before. Um, so you might have trouble at some critical value that you have to avoid. Maybe there something terrible happens and the sheets decide to sort of do something awful above this critical point. We don't know what happens, but away from there, the sheets are nicely behaved. And so, uh, so we can move around, and because it's dimension two or more, you can move around the critical points. There are critical values. Because of the discreteness of critical points, there's, you get discreteness of critical values. So you can wind around them. I suppose it would have been enough to say discrete critical values here. Um, so uh, so we, we can then wind around them with, and avoid them. But that means that when we look at the pre-images up here, we're winding around up here, avoiding problematic points, uh, and staying in the points where this, where this um, where this covering map is always nice, is always a nice covering map. Where the map is always a nice covering map, this map phi. So we avoid any nasty critical points. We stay away from them because we have higher dimension, and we wiggle around, and we never run into trouble. And so that means that the number of sheets, which here in this picture is say there are three sheets above this point here, uh, it stays the same. And whether the sheet is oriented or is is, is uh, mapped by an orientation preserving or reversing map stays the same. If this is uh, orientation reversing and this is orientation preserving near near these points, that'll send maybe reversing here. That'll stay the same as we move along because it's always going to be a covering map. It can't suddenly change its mind about whether it wants the determinant of the of the um, uh, of, of the matrix of this uh, of the the derivative matrix to suddenly change sign from positive to negative without hitting zero, so it means that these uh, travel along always with the same number of points, and so the degree uh, at a point uh, is the same uh, under these assumptions is the same uh, away from uh, from any critical uh, values. So it would be the same everywhere because you could travel around a way avoiding critical values going from any place to any place. So as a simple example of all this happening, um, uh, as a, an example of that example, um, if you consider, uh, uh, let's say, W is P of Z, a complex polynomial function of a complex variable, um, then uh, you can think of having... Um, the manifold P being the uh, the complex plane, and your manifold Q being also the complex plane. The shadow picture is no longer so helpful because, in some sense, this is twists in some really complicated way. Because you get all the different uh, several different points at which the polynomial takes the same value mapping to the same point in Q. So the picture is actually quite complicated how the map actually works. But uh, we can say that uh, there are only finitely many critical points because that's where the derivative is zero of a polynomial. Um, and so the degree is the same everywhere, um, away from the critical values. There are finally many critical values as a consequence. And so you can wiggle around and wind around. Um, and uh, so it's not terribly surprising then that you should only get, that you get the same uh, number of pre-images of any of these points that are non-critical. Um, and I'll leave you to convince yourself that this implies that, uh, that, that it's actually surjective. 
um, that you get. After all, you can you can keep moving around as long as you stay away from critical points. You can move around in the Q plane, and you always have some pre-image uh, number pre-images staying the same. So some pre-images somewhere, and so as long as you avoid critical points, you can always hit. So you could hit all uh, non-critical uh, values, but then you can hit all critical values by definition of critical values. And so what you get is that P is surjective. Um, if it's proper, but to, to, to make this work, the argument needs, um, so if P of Z is a, is a proper, as a proper map, and then it's not terribly difficult to, to prove that um, a polynomial, one complex function of one complex variable is proper, uh, if and only if it's not constant. So what you obtain is the amazing fact that non-constant complex polynomial functions are actually surjective as maps of complex plane to complex plane. They're actually map onto. And in particular, that gives you the fundamental theorem of algebra. Um, the fundamental theorem, of al fundamental theorem of algebra says that they have roots. Uh, well, it hits, takes the value 0. So you take the value 0 somewhere in this plane. Um, well, it has to hit that value because it's onto every value. Okay, so we want to um, understand this degree a little bit more more clearly. Um, I should say, maybe in that particular example of the polynomial, the degree is, of course, the degree as a polynomial. Um, so that's where the terminology degree comes from. It comes from that particular example I just gave. So let's suppose, um, so our next so lemma, um, again, we have P, uh, phi takes P, Q. These are oriented. Uh, they have to be oriented. Manifolds, maybe with corners perhaps with corners, that's allowed, um, uh, equal dimension. So it's all the same hypotheses as we've had before. Now suppose we have uh, phi and psi take not just one, phi and psi both take P to Q. Um, and suppose that they are um, proper. Oh, and I should say, what I should have said is, uh, I think that, oh yeah, they have to take, um, uh, they have to take boundary to boundary. Um, if I made a mistake there, let me see. Um, no, we're okay. So, um, so the, the, we'll assume that the phi of the boundary of P uh, is uh, contained in the boundary of Q. Um, so we're now allowing corners, so we can allow boundaries. the The lecture notes talk about what I've called attached boundary, but in fact, you can whenever you come across the term attached boundary, we haven't introduced a more sophisticated notion of boundary. Uh, you can just drop the word attached and just think of it as boundary. Um, and now suppose there, uh, let's suppose there exists some um, uh, proper uh, homotopy, smooth homotopy. Uh, so that's some uh, homotopy we map phi takes p cross 0, 1 to q, which we always denote as phi sub t of p for phi of p and t. And um, so it's a homotopy between the maps. What does that mean by homotopy? Being a homotopy, I mean the phi zero is this little phi, and phi one is this c. So that's what it means to be a homotopy between two maps. It deforms. This is a deformation parameter t t. And when t is zero, you get the one map. When t is one, you get the other map. So it deforms one map into the other. Um, and suppose there is such a thing. Uh, and again, with uh, we need also that. Um, phi t of boundary p is contained in boundary q. We need to make sure all the time for all t that as it deforms, it continues to take boundary to boundary. Um, and then, um, then I want to say that if um, q naught uh, in q is a regular value of, uh, is it, sorry, is a regular, uh, yeah, regular value. What do I want to say is yeah, regular value. Uh, for both phi and c, then we can um, find that the degrees must match. So this enables us to start, as I said, deforming. We want to take two maps, and we want to try and deform one into the other. It's a bit of a long statement. But what we're assuming is that there is some kind of homotopy between them. If there is some homotopy between them, which has, has the appropriate properties of being proper and mapping boundary to boundary, um, so it deforms one into the other in a proper manner, then their degrees are equal at all their at the at the values that are regular for both of them. Okay, so let's let's see if we can prove this result. Um, we'll start by looking at um, 
uh, so as a proof, um, uh, where are we? Here's a proof. Um, we want to take our, our homotopy and suppose, um, first suppose that uh, Q naught is regular, it's a regular value uh, of the whole homotopy. It's a map, so it could have regular values, and typically most values are regular. And we'll also assume Q naught is not on, uh, on the boundary of Q. So then, um, the implicit function theorem. Um, the implicit function theorem tells us that the uh, preimage of Q naught um, is uh, is some kind of nice curve. It sits in uh, P cross zero one since that's where this capital P was defined on this guy. The preimage of a point lies in here. Um, P and Q had equal dimensions, so you take a point here like its preimage. It would be a point in P at each time t, and so it's actually a curve. Uh, this is a curve in here. Now, it's a curve with corners, perhaps with corners. Okay, so it's some curve, perhaps, with corners. But in fact, we know something about it. Um, the boundary of this guy um, should consist exactly of where it intersects the... Um, uh, this of this curve has to be where it hits into the two ends, and it's going to be, in other words, um, it's going to consist of all the points that that phi maps into it, with the time, the parameter set to set to zero, together with all the ones where the c maps into the end, with the parameter set to one. It can't have anything else in it because of the condition that it took boundary to boundary. Um, meaning, and since this guy's not on the boundary, it can't be coming from the boundary. Um, so there's nothing else in the boundary of P that's going to map to our curve. It's got a bit, the boundary that, that it feels only comes from the boundary of 0, 1, not from the boundary of P. And that's why this guy only feels boundary of 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, so that's why we can be sure that the boundary of this curve looks like this. Of course, the boundary of a curve is a finite set of points. These will be finitely many points. Now this is a curve, so again, as we said before, a curve, uh, it's compact, so it's going to have finitely many circles, and then it's going to have some um, intervals, some guys that are diffeomorphic to intervals, uh, with even number of ends. And one end is going to be on this side, and the other ends are going to be on this side. Um, so that's what it's got to look like. But then we can see, forget about the circles, that all the points that lie here on this inverse image have to lie on one end of one of the one of that curve, and then all the points uh, over here, they all have to lie on the other end. Um, and there are even is, is there are even ends of each. We said that before that that these intervals in each interval has two ends, and so one end coming in from here has to have another end going out from here, and vice versa. So the numbers have to be the same, and the numbers are the degrees. So that makes the degrees match up. Now there's still a bit of a problem because the argument was uh, so far assuming that we had a regular value of this guy, which is not in the boundary. We have two problems. We have to worry about what about boundary, and what about if it's a regular value of the, the phi or the c, but not of the capital phi. But if it's regular, um, so now we'll assume, so now we'll drop that as those assumptions, and so we'll think about what happens in general. If q naught is regular, for uh, v and for c, then what happens? Um, well, if it were on the boundary, uh, then we could pick points nearby not on the boundary that were also regular, because if you have a regular point on the boundary, uh, then by definition, near, near a regular value uh, on the boundary, then, um, then everybody nearby is also regular. So no problem there. Um, we can just... Um, we, we, we can just use one of those. We can push it a little bit away from the boundary. And so it's not a danger there. Um, and that will, that will only um, lead us to uh, the same values of these guys for all the nearby points, and then we can take limits. So it's not too dangerous to, to think about what happens if it's a boundary point. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, now, what, what, what happens if it's, um, it, so if it's not a boundary point, but what if it's not a regular uh, value um, uh, we this argument assumes the regular value of this of this capital phi. What if it's not a regular value of capital phi? Then again, you can perturb it a little bit. 
and because there there's no way an open set of uh, uh, to have an open set of critical points, we know that uh, the 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 um, of critical values. We know that the, the critical values are measure zero, so we can arbitrarily close by find uh, regular values. So we use close by regular values because the the Sard theorem tells us that they have to exist. You can't have a whole neighborhood of 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 critical point of critical values. You can have a neighborhood of critical points, but not critical values. Um, so uh, so if you're at a point that's not a that's not a regular value, perturb a little bit, and you get to uh, to use this argument. But then you can take limits, and the numbers aren't changing as you take those limits. Um, so the numbers are matched up as you take the limits. Now let's think about what we can do with diffeomorphisms of manifolds. How powerful are they? Um, and uh, so I want to think first of all about if we had a homotopy between maps, so homotopy, um, this guy, um, then it has a so-called reverse homotopy or inverse homotopy, which is 5, 1 minus t to reverse the t time parameter from going from 0 to 1 to going from 1 to 0. Um, Okay, and then if a homotopy, um, if a homotopy says that phi t is a diffeomorphism, um, uh, if is a diffeomorphism for all t, um, so it's a family of maps parameterized by parameter t. If, we, if all those maps are, are diffeomorphisms, it's called an isotopy. Um, and then. Um, we're in, so we'll be interested not just in not just in in families of maps, but families of diffeomorphisms. A family of diffeomorphisms is an isotopy. Um, so it's a homotopy through diffeomorphisms. Now I want to think about how we can glue together um, isotopies or homotopies. Um, what you would imagine first of all is that you'd deform. You'd start off with one map, and you'd deform it into another through a family of maps, and then you'd take this map and deform it into another one through a family of maps. The problem is that this, uh, you can then say, okay, well, I'm just going to compose. I'll go around this, along this one, and then along that one. So if I have some deformation for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1, this one, and then this is 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1, then I'd, what I'd do is put them together to make a whole deformation um, by, by speeding up the time parameter here so that it becomes 2t instead of t, um, so it takes only time 1 half, and then this guy will be 2t uh, would well won't work because now I'm starting at a half that's going to start at one, so I'll subtract one, and that'll give me um, a time parameter that goes in this case uh, from instead of zero to zero to one it goes from zero to a half, and then this guy goes from a half to one, and it goes along this and then along that. So I, in that sense, I can compose, and I'll leave you to to read the notes to get a precise definition of composition. But it means you have a sort of deformation of one map into another, deformation of this map into this one. I can do this deformation and then this deformation. Um, and uh, I just have to make sure that I that I speed up my time parameters so that if this was 0 to 1 time, this is 0 to 1 time, then I speed it up so that this becomes 0 to 1 time. Now that works perfectly well uh, when we only want to do continuous deformations. But what if I want to do smooth deformations? Then it doesn't work anymore. I need something else. So what I need to do is to kind of speed up and slow down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some tau of t uh, function, which is going to take, say, 0, 1 to 0, 1. Uh, and it's going to be tau of t is 0 constant uh, on some interval uh, near uh, 0. And then tau of t is going to be equal to 1 constant near 1. And then if you take any homotopy, this is some smooth homotopy between smooth maps, um, then replace it by phi of tau of t. What you get is uh, still a smooth homotopy, but it's constant uh, for uh, t near 0 or near 1. So that, that means it doesn't change, so it somehow stays the same for a while. Then it smoothly uh, goes up toward the other, toward 1, and then it stays the same for a while. So instead of going t going from uh, 0 to 1, um, it goes uh, stays at 0, and then tau, tau of t stays at 0 for a while. It goes up and then stays at 1. And that way you can make uh, this guy be constant, as deformation that stays constant for a while, then begins to move, then stays constant for a while. 
and then I'll leave you to convince yourself that if you wanted to glue together homotopies, um, if I want to glue together, I have some map which has some image, maybe some curve in the plane, and I homotopically move that curve to form it uh, smoothly into another curve, and then I homotopically smoothly deform that curve into another curve. The two might not fit together. This and this might actually meet at some some nasty angle. So the resulting swept out object is some kind of is some kind of surface that um, that meets with a nasty angle here. So it doesn't actually meet smoothly. But if you replace this one by uh, phi of this was this is some homotopy phi, this is some homotopy psi. If you replace phi by phi tau of t instead of phi of t, and then this psi by this, that's this guy. We replace the guy up here in the place, we replace it down here by some psi tau of t, then uh, they stay constant for a while. It just sits there for a while, and then it starts to move, and then it sits there for a while. And then if we first follow this guy for a while, and then once we get to the end, we stop for a while, and then we follow this guy for a while. Um, then we can put the two together by the same formula I gave before, speeding this one up to take only time a half, this one would only take time from one half to one. Um, you glue them together and you get a smooth uh, gluing of the homotopies. The homotopies glue together produce a smooth uh, uh, composition of homotopies. Uh, and what I what I mean by that intuitively is that if I can smoothly deform this curve into this one, and smoothly deform from this curve into this one, the picture might fit together to produce some kind of sharp surface with a sharp angle in it on here, but I can still smoothly do this and then slow down to zero speed and stay there for a while, and then zero speed uh, starts, uh, this thing starts to move and slides down here and then slows down to zero speed here, and that motion put together will actually be C infinity smooth. Obviously, the precise details of writing out all the formulas are done in the lecture notes. So we can smoothly put uh, smooth homotopies together to get smooth homotopies that do what the first one does and then what the second one does. Okay, so now we can use this concept of smooth homotopy. And again, there's details in the notes if you're not quite following what are the details here. Um, uh, the, so that uh, we can use them to produce the following useful result. Um, if we have M0 and M1 points of a manifold M, which could be manifold with corners. Um, and suppose that they're both in the interior. They're not in the boundary. Um, then, um, then there exists um, a smooth uh, uh, isotopy. So remember that's a family of diffeomorphisms, phi uh, takes m cross 0, 1, 0, 1 to m. So a family of maps, that which we write as phi t of m for, as always, for phi of m t or tm, which however I wrote the notation different than notes, I think. Anyway, um, uh, so that uh, phi uh, 0 of m is m, that's the identity map. At time 0, it starts at the identity map, and then gradually it deforms into a different map, a diffeom not just a different map, but a diffeomorphism. It deforms, it's an isotopy, so it deforms through diffeomorphisms. It starts at the identity diffeomorphism, gradually changing diffeomorphism. Um, Oh, also that um, I want to say um, phi t of m is m for all m outside uh, some compact set. So it only moves a compact set of points. It doesn't move very many points. And initially, it doesn't move any points. Uh, over time, it starts moving some points, but only inside some compact set. And then finally, um, uh, uh, phi 1 uh, at the end of its motion, sorry, phi 1 at the end of its motion takes m naught to m1. Oh, and should be, uh, m should be connected, obviously, otherwise I certainly can't do this. So what I'm saying here, putting it all together, is that I have a manifold uh, and it has two points in it, and they're not on the boundary. What I can do is start off by not moving any points at all, and slowly I can start moving this point toward this one. And I can do it in such a way as to think of it as a as a water balloon. And there's a little part 
particle in the water here and a little particle in the water. I can move the water everywhere inside the water balloon. So it's not just that point is moving. All the points are moving. But they're moving more slowly as you get toward the boundary. And in fact, outside of some compact set, they're not even moving at all. So there's some compact set inside the manifold that has all the motion in it, all the water that moves in the water balloon, is inside this compact subset of it. Outside here, all the water is staying still all the time. Initially, this nothing's moving, and then gradually things start to move, and it just flows this point to this point in, uh, in, in a way that makes the motion slower and slower as you get toward the boundary of this red compact set, and only the red compact set moves, nothing moves outside of it. Okay, how do we prove this result? The idea is very simple. You could start off with just a ball, and if you only had a ball to work with, uh, it wouldn't be so hard. Um, then what you'd do is set up a, uh, a straight line, uh, vec just pick a vector that moves this guy to this guy. Um, now make a vector field that's equal to that vector everywhere, a constant, and then multiply by a bump function. So take a bump function at zero out here, goes to one in here, and goes to zero here. We can make it one inside here in this little compact set, zero outside some larger red compact set. So just doing this inside a ball, I'm just doing the special case of P is a closed ball, um, uh, or M, sorry, M is a closed ball. Um, so the case of M is a closed ball, what you can do again is take a vector that points from this point you want to go from to the point you want to go to. Um, so in time one, if you follow the flow of that vector, you'll get where you want to go. Now take the constant vector field throughout all of Euclidean space, which is just constantly equal to that vector, but multiplied by a bump. So inside this region where the bump is 1, you in time 1 flow from here to here. But outside this red set, you don't flow at all, and you stay, all points stay perfectly still. So for a ball, we're done. And in fact, the same uh, works for uh, any, for not just a ball, but for any, uh, so let's say, uh, a convex set. Um, so for example, standard for the standard corner, it works as well because you could use the same picture. Uh, you'd have uh, the two points, one you want to go from, one you want to go to, you pick the vector taking you from one to the other, flow along for time one, that's where you go. You take the constant vector field everywhere equal to that guy, you multiply it by a bump um, that's isolated very, very close to these region with these two points in it. Um, so so our bump function is zero out here, and so we take a vector. Our vector field is just exactly the difference between these two points. It's just m1 minus m0 as a vector, but then multiplied by, um, I don't like that, I want my vector field to be a bump function multiplied by the difference of the points in the coordinates. So that's that's going to work in any region of Euclidean space that's convex, because you can go from one to the other on a line segment. So that works fine um, to get from one to the other. If they're in the same, the same uh, little ball or, or little piece of the standard corner, um, the problem is what to do if they're not. And then you need to compose. So what you want to do is to show, show that if they're not in the same, um, they're not that close to each other, maybe they're very, very far away, so they don't exist in the same coordinate chart. What you need to do is to take a path that connects them we know that manifolds, uh, the connected manifolds are path connected. So we can assume that our manifold is path connected. We take a path from M0 to M1. Then we can pick points along the path which are so close together that they successively all lie in the same coordinate chart. Any, these two lie in the same chart, these, these two are in the same chart, these two are in the same chart, and so on. And using those charts, we can repeat the, the, the argument we just gave, that there is an isotopy that'll move this point to this point and be dead outside of some compact set in here, and so on and so forth. And then I just compose the isotopies all the way along, and I'll get from one to the other. So that's the argument. Um, there are lots of details in the notes, but that's the idea of it. It's very simple. So now we want to put that together and use it to get a rather big theorem about um, degrees. Um, it says that if we have uh, P to, whoops, to Q, a uh, smooth map of manifolds with corners as usual, oriented, right? Oriented manifolds with corners. And of course, it has to be a smooth map and proper. Um, and then, uh, and it has to take boundary to boundary, otherwise it won't work. Uh, it's contained in boundary Q. Um, 
and Q has to be connected to get all this to work, then uh, we claim that the um, degree, uh, we define a degree at regular points for the map, uh, is the same at all regular uh, values, Q9, Q. So that's pretty surprising what we've been able to get to work for all the regular values. Um, it's not so surprising when we think about our complex uh, polynomial example, which is a very nice example. You can sort of see more or less what's happening there, why this would work. As a consequence, we can just define degree phi to be the degree of at Q0 of phi for any regular, uh, regular value Q0. How do we prove this? Um, what we'll do is just to take two um, take two points Q0 and Q1 in Q minus the boundary of Q, um, and we'll try to calculate out uh, the degree. Um, so we can take some isotopy phi takes um, Q cross 0, 1 to Q with phi, what do we want? Phi 0 is the identity map, and then phi 1 of Q0 is Q1. Um, and uh, and then also that phi uh, t of q is q outside some compact set. Okay, so we've got this, which we got from our previous result. We could move one point to the other. Um, so now what we can do is to look at um, the map uh, phi t composed with a little phi. Um, so this map is uh, is proper, and, um, and and because this is a diffeomorphism, the degree is invariant. The degree of phi t composed phi is the degree of phi because they're really the same map after some diffeomorphism. A diffeomorphism doesn't change anything; can't change any signs or anything else. I should point out it's actually an orientation preserving diffeomorphism because uh, this guy. Uh, initially as the identity, so it preserves orientation, and then it uh, it always, um, therefore after that conti it continuously varies, so it can't, uh, it's an isotopy, it can, can't, can't change. Um, oh, and also I should have insisted, I guess, that it should be phi of boundary of q cross 0, 1, uh, should be contained in boundary q, is that what I want, I think, yeah. So, um, so we've got, well, it's, yeah, okay, that's fine, actually, because it's, that's equal to the identity outside of complex set, so sorry, I don't need that. All right, so, uh, so, so these are the same map, essentially, up to a diffeomorphism, so they have the same degree because they look exactly the same. We can completely, completely identify all the points and all the degrees and everything. Um, uh, so, um, uh, that, so that matches everything up. Um, but, um, uh, but then we now have homotopy, um, between, um, uh, so the, well, this should be degree at, let's say, at Q0. Uh, sorry, what do I want to say? I want to count the degree correctly. Uh, this should be the degree, this one should be the degree at the corresponding point at phi t of Q0 of phi t composed phi is the degree at Q0 of phi. Okay, so that's that's the same statement. It's just saying we calculate the degree here by calculating these preimages, but then the diffeomorphism phi t just moves everything to er to the same sort of thing, the same orientations uh, corresponding and all that. So it doesn't uh, doesn't really change anything, um, and so we can we can calculate degrees at corresponding points. Okay, so um, but then uh, by its homotopy. It's actually an isotopy. So we have a homotopy, and so we had invariance under homotopy of the of the degree, and so we get the degree uh, at Q1 of phi 1 composed phi is the degree at Q0 of phi. Okay, so that uh, that gives the result. Now, that only gave the result at interior points. I had to assume that Q0 and Q1 were uh, where Q0 and Q1 were inside, not on the boundary. But you can, uh, at, at boundary points, you can take limits um, because we're only interested in regular values. Uh, if you take a regular boundary point, it's very close to regular uh, interior points. Regular uh, boundary value uh, is close to regular interior value. So not a problem there. Okay.
So we have finally this degree invariance and we're able to calculate the degree of a map. And we understand that, the, that it really is a homotopy invariant, that it doesn't matter where you are. Um, so we can move the map around uh, by homotopy and we can move around to different points in, in, the, in the image Q and we get the same answer. So for example, we go back to our example of a polynomial, W is um, some P of Z, write the polynomials A naught plus A one Z plus dot dot plus A N Z to the N. We could try and do a homotopy to get rid of of all of these values. Uh, we just make some kind of homotopy phi T of Z is, uh, well, let's say T times all the terms we don't like, uh, a n minus 1, z to the n minus 1, um, plus uh, some, plus we fix the highest term, a n z to the n. So we'll leave the highest term, but we'll try and homotope the rest by some parameter t, which will go between, uh, so phi 0 of z is just a n z to the n, and then phi, uh, that's phi 0, phi 1 of z is p of z. That's a homotopy, and of course the hard part you have to check is that it's actually a proper homotopy. You have to make sure that it's a proper homotopy between them. But it does show then, if you've worked it out, it is, and you can prove then that uh, you get a proper homotopy between this very simple polynomial and this one. But then you can calculate the degree of this guy. Uh, well, you could also make another homotopy that you could homotopically make a, this a n constant, which is presume, we presume is non-zero. Right? It's a degree n polynomial, so assume that's non-zero and degree n. Uh, you could make that homotope that to one uh, without changing anything. So that would also be a proper homotopy. And so we can actually arrange that this thing uh, properly homotopes its way uh, between this complicated polynomial and this very simple one. But I can calculate the degree of this polynomial trivially, its degree as a map uh, in the sense of differential geometry we've defined here of a and z to the n is n, assuming that a n is some non-zero constant. And that's easy to check because it has n pre-images to each point. You have to solve um, for some generic, for some regular value, a n z to the n is w naught. Some This is our regular value, which we were calling q naught before. Now it's w's because they're a complex number. Um, and so the solutions are just z n is w naught over a n, or z n, z is uh, nth uh, root of uh, w naught over a, uh, n root of w naught over a n, and we know that there are exactly n of those roots for generically chosen w, um, but not for non-zero w naught. So, so that'll give us that this guy is degree n, and therefore by the homotopy principle we've got that these things don't change under proper homotopy. Once you check this is proper, then you can get everybody to be homotopic to something very, very simple where you can explicitly calculate degree.